Hey everybody, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, once again, I'm sorry I could not be there with you in person, um, but hopefully the notes that we take online here will uh, will serve the same function. Um, so I'm going to present them just like normal. Uh, I expect you guys to take notes just like normal, like we would in class. Um, but as always, if you have any questions, which I hope you do, uh, sh feel free to shoot me an email uh, if I'm not back yet at matt.turner at lsr7.net. Uh, I'll also warn you that this program I'm using uh, only allows you to record in 15 minute increments. So um, so if we run out of time, there may, will be a second part added. So make sure to check that out. So let's go ahead and take a look at our topic for today. Um, our discussion is going to be about the War of 1812, which uh, is a very interesting time in American history. Um, and one that I think it's often overshadowed, you know, we like to focus on the American Revolution about 40 years before uh, and about the Civil War that comes about 50 years after. So uh, this war is kind of sandwiched in between, but uh, had very real consequences for the newly created American Republic. Uh, and as you can tell, they're on the notes. Often it's called the Second War of Independence. Um, before we get started, as always, I like to focus on uh, geography and take a look at the map down in the bottom right hand corner. And I'll hide my ugly mug here in a second. Uh, you'll notice where a lot of the fighting is taking place uh, along the border with Canada, which remember, Canada is still a, a, a province of, um, of Great Britain. Um, so they still have a lot of forts there. You remember I talked about um, how a lot of British soldiers were still in forts, even in American territory at this point. Um, but also a lot of the fighting is taking place on the seas. You can see that uh, the British are going to form a blockade. Uh, and that really is what is at the heart of the issue is trade. Um, that the British were stopping American trade, and uh, that was a big problem uh, because when you are not economically independent, um, it's very difficult to be politically independent. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Uh, as always, we're going to go ahead and uh, begin with the causes of uh, the War of 1812. And, of course, everything in this class begins with Napoleon. Uh, so by 1807, um, you know, Napoleon's been in power there for, for approximately seven years. And by this point, though, he has subdued all of the countries of Europe. Uh, and he's threatening his rule uh, against all of them. Now, in an effort to weaken France's main opponent, and of course that is Britain, uh, who dominates the seas, uh, he introduces uh, a, an economic boycott of the entire continent, uh, meaning that no one in Europe is to be trading with outside uh, countries. Um, now, this is mainly in an effort to, to hurt Britain economically, um, but this is called the continental system, um, trying to trade within Europe itself, uh, no one was allowed to, to trade with Britain. Now, of course, that is almost impossible to enforce. Uh, and, and, you know, Napoleon may have known about that, but uh, frankly, um, you know, the, the short-term benefits of something like this, he saw to be more beneficial. So smuggling uh, throughout Europe is going to increase drastically, uh, and Napoleon's going to have to spend more and more time enforcing this system uh, on European nations. In fact, you will remember during the Latin American Wars of Independence, we talked a lot about how, um, you know, when Napoleon swept through Spain on his way to punish Portugal, that's that's what this was for, the, uh, the continental system. So anyways, back to the overall point. Britain is responding by increasing its control of the seas, which a uh, small island nation, uh, you know, we, we've discuss multiple times how, how their naval power has always been extremely strong. So what Britain is going to do is blockade most of Europe from foreign trade, uh, and that ends up having an effect on the United States. So the United States, because of this blockade, cannot trade goods with Europe. Uh, and when we cannot sell goods, that threatens our survival. So uh, through this um, you know, fight between Britain and France, the United States kind of gets thrown into it. But there's other issues at stake. It's not just trade. That might have been the biggest one. But there's other issues here that have to be settled between the British. We had signed a, a peace treaty with them that, frankly, they have not fulfilled um, yet. So uh, let's go and take a look at the causes. Uh, the growing list of grievances with Great Britain. Uh, number one, as I said, is trade. Okay, trade restrictions that uh, were being enforced on the United States due to Britain's war with France. 
Um, the American international trade had grown tremendously as the American Republic um, became established in the early 1800s, and it was uh, threatening Britain's monopoly of the seas. Um, so Britain wasn't too happy with us because we were a growing economic power. Um, now, you might be wondering, well, you know, what was our relationship with Britain? You know, we talked about the Jays Treaty and, uh, you know, how our relationship had been reestablished with Britain. And that's right. Uh, most of our trade actually went to Britain. Um, but uh, much of the trade went elsewhere, and uh, a lot of that included France as well. So Britain wanted to put an end to this. They wanted to stop America trading with France. Um, so they have kind of a grievance with us. We have a grievance with them. Uh, when you have those mutual grievances, often war is uh, what occurs. The second issue that causes the War of 1812 is what we call impressment. Okay. Now, I talked about this issue with the Barbary Wars, uh, that American sold, uh, sailors were being uh, captured and forced into the service of other nations. Um, but the second cause of the war is the impressment of U.S. sailors into the British Navy. Pretty amazing stat here. Uh, over 10,000 U.S. sailors, um, and I should say approximately 1,000 of those were naturalized citizens, meaning that they had come from other areas and become U.S. citizens. Um, about 10,000 U.S. sailors were forced into the British service. Um, now, what would often happen is a British ship would stop an American ship. Um, they would force their way on board, and then they would basically say, you guys are all deserters. Uh, you were part of the British Navy, and now we're basically forcing you uh, back into it. And uh, you know, once again, when somebody's got a gun to your head, uh, what are you going to do? Well, 10,000 U.S. sailors are basically being kidnapped uh, on the high seas. So that's a very big problem uh, for the early American empire. The third cause, uh, and this is the, the only domestic cause, um, was the, the relationship between the United States, Great Britain, and the Native American tribes, especially in the western part of the United States. We had discussed westward expansion taking place, especially through the Ohio Valley. Uh, as we are pushing west, you know, that frontier, we're still at a point where, you know, Indiana is the frontier. Well, um, the British had been openly supporting Native American tribes against westward expansion. And even though that Northwest Territory had been given to the United States, um, neither the, uh, the, the British or Americans uh, had really taken into account the thousands of uh, Native Americans that were currently residing there. Uh, and so you had a lot of resistance from Native Americans in this, these newly added uh, territories. Now, the main leader of the Native American forces is an, uh, a man named Tecumseh. Okay, T-E-C-U-M-S-E-H, Tecumseh. Okay, and he and his brother, uh, who was often called the Prophet, uh, they sought to unite all of the Indian tribes together to resist American expansion. Uh, and they are primarily going to seek out um, their weapons through the British. They are going to be armed from the British. And this primarily takes place from Canada. So you have this, this issue uh, going on along uh, the United States' northern border that involves, as I said, kind of this triangle uh, going on where, where all parties are kind of upset with one another in, in some way. Now, before the war began, Tecumseh was the main negotiator for the Indian tribes, uh, and he was primarily dealing with uh, what will become a future U.S. president, uh, and he will become a war hero during this conflict, and that is William Henry Harrison. Uh, and later on, we'll see the, the two face off in a, uh, one of the largest battles of the War of 1812. Um, but this Native American problem uh, is not solved for a very long time. Um, you know, these people were being forced off of their lands, and, um, uh, you know, so they are, they're going to fight for those. Uh, and, and as we know, this is a problem that, that exists for um, uh, centuries. Um, so very sad. Um, but that is the third cause was the British support of Native American tribes against westward expansion. Okay, well, let's go and take a look at where this war is fought, the theaters of war. As I said, the War of 1812 is primarily fought on the seas. It's, it's going to be primarily a naval battle. 
you have a lot of merchant ships uh, that are being attacked, uh, and the British are effectively laying a blockade along the Atlantic coastline, as you can see from that map. So uh, a lot of this war is fought at sea, which uh, I don't know why, but I think people don't find that as exciting, so perhaps that's why this war kind of takes a, a backseat. But there is a lot of land fighting uh, domestically. Uh, along the American-Canadian border, uh, you had both land and naval battles taking place. Even on the Great Lakes, uh, you had naval warfare taking place there. Um, but the British troops are very strong. Uh, there, there's a lot of British troops along this border um, uh, to our north. The third place that fighting takes place is the American South, uh, which we had seen in the American Revolution as well. Um, you know, the if, if you look at that map and you look down at the bottom left-hand corner, the southwest corner there, you'll see that New Orleans has a star on it, uh, which, which denotes an American victory. But this is going to be a major battle. See, the Mississippi River was an extremely important geographical landmark for the United States because that allowed trade from the inside of America to the ocean. Uh, if you do not control New Orleans, you basically lose control of the Mississippi River, and it becomes extremely difficult to get your goods from, say, Illinois, Indiana, or, or even Kentucky uh, westward. You know, you have to cross the Appalachian Mountains. So river trade is very important to uh, the early republic. If we don't control the Mississippi, if we don't control the, uh, the city of New Orleans, we are going to be in trouble economically. So... Um, the American South, the, the British know this, uh, the, their Indian allies, they also know this. They are going to try to cut us off from the Mississippi River, and they are going to do that by sending a large fighting force to the city of New Orleans. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on and talk about some of the actual fighting. Uh, and again, sadly, I, I wish I could talk about these more in detail because each of these battles is uh, pretty amazing in their, their own right. Um, but we'll start with the, the first major battle, uh, and that is the Battle of Tippecanoe. Okay? Now, Tippecanoe is considered the first battle of the War of 1812. Now, even though it came six months before any official declaration of war, it was uh, still considered the, the first uh, battle of the war. Now, the location of the Battle of Tippecanoe uh, is in modern-day Indiana, and this this uh, battle was between Tecumseh's brother, who we said the prophet, okay, and William Henry Harrison. Uh, now, Harrison had made a uh, his, his name well-known um, because he had been very successful in destroying uh, the native Confederacy headquarters, uh, and basically he becomes a war hero because of this. Um, but you'll often find that historians argue uh, the limits of the, the real effects of, uh, of what Harrison did, because uh, the headquarters uh, was actually rebuilt. The, the Native American headquarters called Prophetstown, uh, it was rebuilt, and Native of Resistance continued even during the war. So, uh, you know, yes, it was a great victory for the United States and Harrison, uh, but you have to question, you know, what exactly was the, the true effect? Because they basically just picked up where they had left off and, and continued resistance in the West. The other areas, as, as I focused on, uh, that a lot of this war would be fought, was the Canadian expeditions. Um, the United States during this war will three separate times try to invade Canada, and they will fail in each of those. Um, the most... Um, probably violent of any of those, uh, took place in April of 1813, uh, where the United States invades Canada and tries to capture uh, the city of York. Okay, Now, York would later turn into the modern-day city of Toronto. Okay, So the United States is basically invading uh, north of Michigan. We're, we're pushing eastward uh, to the trying to take out the city of York, um, and we, we are successful in that. In fact, they burn the city to the ground. So Toronto uh, is, is burned to the ground, then known as York. We're coming up on that 15-minute mark. I'm going to have to start a new video session here. Uh, and when we do, we'll pick it back up with the retaliation uh, from the, the British uh, and their burning of Washington, D.C.